This Zero Now program is brought to you with the support of our founding partners. I can't be protected by hopes and prayers. I won't use hope towards what's next. I'll make my own way. I know impossible is an opinion. I won't wait for safer schools. I want to create them. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I refuse to be a victim. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I am just one person. Determined to bring us back to zero. Thank you so much, Andrew, for doing this interview with us today. How about you start with some backstory of how you got involved with Zero Now and how you came yeah. about to found Covexa? Yeah, great. And I'll, I'll start with my the background of founding Covexa because I think that'll loop in that way. Uh, first of all, Michael, great to be here, uh, and I really appreciate your time on such a very important topic overall. Um, I founded Covexa three years ago, right in the beginning of the pandemic, where. Um, everything was shutting down. Prior to that, and I'll explain what Covexa does, I spent 25 years in the tech industry, uh, working as a leader in companies like Microsoft for 12 years and Samsung globally, uh, living out of Korea uh, around education. Uh, and then my final big corporate job was with Amazon Web Services, where again, a, another global business around education. Um, Covexa came to me uh, during the pandemic uh, not necessarily, uh, I was deliberately wanting to build my own company, but I was at a stage where um, it was traveling just stopped and I didn't want to start traveling again, but more importantly, I need, wanted to be home with my kids uh, to help them with their learning because I realized that online learning was not necessarily probably optimal for them uh, because my kids have sometimes some learning challenges. How I got involved, uh, and so it, I formed Covexa to me more of a very education sort of boutique advisory consulting and investment company. Investment. I'm a part of a venture capital out in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, that's not necessarily re relative to that, but that's part of that. But on the consulting, I consult with uh, World Bank on educational issues globally uh, in other countries in the Middle East, Africa, in, in Asian uh, countries. Uh, and uh, I also consult and help school districts and universities on a variety of things, usually technology, teaching and learning, school safety, data, all the stuff that or just uh, upon education all at once in, in a very sudden way. Uh, and then I do a lot of other type of work with other education technology companies, help them accelerate position into the business. How I got involved with Zero Now is a, a little bit of a coincidence. Uh, we got to know Ara, we, we live relatively close to one another. And I was always tracking what he has done with the whole area with Omni Alert and the school safety. And I actually have a, a counterterrorism uh, homeland security background. <laughs> Uh, when I was with one of those large companies, uh, I helped uh, win probably one of the largest counterterrorism systems in the planet with New York City uh, under Mayor Bloomberg at the time that I think I can disclose because it's all open source information where they were doing very sophisticated camera, uh, license plate readers in Manhattan, uh, and even radiation detections and all that stuff. So taking that advanced technology to prevent the next big attack, if you will. Uh, as New York City is the most vulnerable city on the planet when it comes to uh, danger from, from bad people. And so leveraging that technology, leveraging not just the technology, but the understanding of how you need multiple layers to protect an asset, a building, a student population, is really common use uh, that I'm seeing happen to prevent a lot of school incidents as well. So using that technology knowledge, education background, connecting with Zero Now and understanding what they were about, I mean, to me, it was a, a no-brainer that we all aligned with the same core values and wanted to help each other out to really, again, uh, have less, if not zero, <laughs> any more of these incidents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love what you said about leveraging technologies to protect an asset. Obviously, that would include or encompass a place like a school. So throughout these desensitized interviews, I've talked to a lot of folks in ed tech. So I'm curious, how do you guys at Covexa differentiate yourself? What are you guys doing specifically in the field of ed tech? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't have a software product, so I my uh, benefit is... I don't have to rely on one software product and just market and sell that and think that's the best. I look at the whole picture across the board. Uh, and so not is it only technology that exists today, but even the future. 
you're hearing all these buzzwords of generative AI, and now is that evolution of technology can prevent and do a lot more sophisticated things to either prevent or help recover during that. So I advise, I leverage my, um, my own ability and networks of individuals, companies, the startup companies especially, who are coming out with new advanced technology to do that. And I try to piece it together. And then so if a superintendent or a school resource officer goes, hey, where do I go? Where do I start? And I give them at least the ideas, the concept, the framework. Uh, and that's kind of where it's been going. And then I would pull the respective vendors in to do the showcase and do the piloting or whatever have you, and then kind of bridge those things together because it's complicated, Michael. I mean, if it was that easy, if, if there was one little thing that could solve all the problem, it probably would have been done by now. But as you know, um, it really touches so many different aspects uh, um, and, and, and that is, makes it complicated in a, in a system that's not necessarily always agile and very holistic thinking. What would you say the biggest challenge has been? Wow, <clears throat> the biggest challenge, I, I'd say, I don't know if there's one. I think there's probably a couple. I think number one, I think there's a lot of um, challenges of thinking that if I just install this thing, it'll help some prevention, like cameras. Already, 55% of the schools have some form of camera system, if not more by now. You know? But that's not enough. You know, they're seeing a lot of social-emotional challenges. Uh, and so how do you prevent that? How do you prevent and understand what's happening at home, outside of school, that will ultimately affect the individual in school? Because as you know, students don't spend all their time there and sometimes home life, family life, um, things that are happening outside school, the school have no idea and information on that. And collecting that information to make informed decisions while also respecting the privacy of some of the students and the environment surrounding is a very tricky thing. So. It's riddled with compliance challenges, barriers, resources. Um, you know, how many, uh, you know, school security officers do you need to really feel safe? How many, uh, uh, you know, technology type of systems do you really need to install? So there's so many layers and complications. Uh, um, and, and then with the policies on top of that, I think it makes it very, very challenging for someone to manage a school sometimes of 90,000 students, right? And any one of them could happen. It's very difficult to really prevent everything and make sure everyone is happy, well, uh, and, and, you know, doing what school should be doing, learning. Mm -hmm. right. So I want to talk a little bit more about one of those challenges specifically, which is the privacy challenge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I hear a lot about from peers, you know, what the implications are of ed tech. Does it mean, you know, surveillance in our email, surveillance of our social media? And then where do you draw that line when it becomes Mm -hmm. When it gets to a point where you're living in a surveillance state where you have no privacy yeah. in the name of safety. So how have you sort yeah. of been thinking about that, that dichotomy there with respecting people's privacy, but then yeah. also making sure that we have the, the proper uh, tools to keep schools safe? Yeah. That's a great question. And this is one of those things. And I, I start with data. The core end of it is data, whether you're on social media or, or whether you're – You've done something and you're now in the school incident report system, right? It's information and data. And it's tricky for a couple things because A, as you said, there are privacy matters, even when you're of, of a majority over the age of 18. If you go below 18, it even gets more tricky. But if you go below 13, there's even other compliance that come in like SIPA and FERPA and COPA. There's so many different agencies that throw so many different compliances. So that's like already like a jigsaw puzzle to figure out. But when it goes to data, in education, there's not really a lot of data governance. Who's allowed to touch it? And, and I don't know if people realize, once you start putting medical information, especially when there's a lot of mental health issues, um, then even there's a, even a smaller finite set of individuals who are allowed to touch it. You know, maybe teachers are not allowed to look at health records. Uh, and, and so complicated, even mixing data becomes scary. So often, Michael, what I've seen, unfortunately, and I probably hate to say it this way, is Sometimes they don't want to know because if they do know and they identify it, but they can't then now do something about it. So the recovery, so the, let's say you identify a potential and then you don't do it, then now all of a sudden you become liable. And that also becomes a very scary thing. So you see the, the challenges because we're in this like really litigious compliance driven world to protect the privacy of school, students, teachers, administrators, everybody. But then, how, but you need some of that information to stop it. And I don't think people have figured that out. And I think one of the fundamental things is get your data governance structure correct. You know, have policies 
Okay, when this happens, this is it. There's a high chance of a risk. That needs to go to this group uh, to handle and triage and be transparent about it because you need to communicate with a lot of the communities as what certain things are. And then sometimes you gotta keep it really private and confidential, especially if there is law enforcement or other medical health uh, interventions that occur. So I think the use of educational technology to prevent cyber attacks is, mm -hmm. I think the link there is pretty clear. But what yeah. I'm interested in, how do you use ed tech to prevent harm in schools caused yeah. by students bringing weapons and causing these mass casualty attacks that we see all too often? What's ed tech's role there? Yeah, another great question. So what we're seeing is that is starting to, uh, it, it hasn't been perfected, but now, um, you know, I'll call it the silver lining, if perhaps if I may say that about the pandemic is now that we have devices for uh, hopefully knock on what the majority of learners out there, right, with internet connectivity. There are things on the system, just like a social media, Michael, if you go to Facebook or Twitter, they're kind of tracking your behavior, you know, you've mm -hmm. allowed that to happen and they know that you might get, you know, uh, hungry for a ham uh, you might want to desire a hamburger, but you're not even hungry, but kind of accurate. Like, yeah, I kind of want them. Well, how the heck did they know that? <laughs> well, they knew that, but the things you clicked on, like the posting chats, and all those, I'll call it unstructured data, somebody in the algorithm back in one of those companies says the predictive possibilities are high for this, which they serve advertisements. Same thing in schools can be possible today uh, because now they all have devices, Chromebooks, Windows, MacBooks. And they're doing things on those devices. They could be in a learning management system going, hey, I'm really struggling with this, Michael, talking to them. And that is technically school property, the devices too. And so there are sometimes I've seen letters go out to say, hey, we may be recording things to help improve learning and all that. Uh, but again, it goes back to data governance. But ed techs now being on those devices, on the network, you can actually track and see a lot more. But I haven't seen that evolve just yet. I think what's going to break that mold is not so much the incidents. I think what's breaking that mold is this whole generative AI. That is actually picked up on a whole nother momentum where now the generative AI is taking big data, pulling data from everywhere, and you're starting to interact with natural language, human language, like ChatGPT and Bard from Google. <clears throat> you can get a lot of information, and now I believe the next evolution of EdTech is they're going to take that type of concept, put it within the school data behind their own firewall, and see certain patterns and all that stuff over time. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that sounds in many ways very promising, but one thing that I'm thinking about is the difficulties around preventing a crime before mm -hmm. it happens. Sure. Um, and with that comes a yeah. series of assumptions that you're making about a person's behavior, which could become a slippery slope. You could you know, start to okay. see some, some bias in there, some stereotyping in there. So where where's your thinking sort of around those issues how can technology yeah. combat that yeah that's a great uh, comment because even when i was at amazon <clears throat> there was a certain uh sheriff department uh who thought that the facial recognition had potentially biases toward it right because the the skin color of an individual and and the lighting wasn't bright and it would do some interesting detections or inaccurate detections if you will so uh, it's still created by humans so um, and that's why I think it's not perfected yet, Mike. I think we're in the cusp of how it's going to evolve quickly. Having all the students have data now, that's step number one, that's, that's gonna start collecting. Now the evolution of technology maturing to take that data and make people, uh, not in programmers, easy, but layman's like myself, leverage it to find and look at insights is going to evolve. And then the compliance and policies that would allow for it governance to happen is going to be those sort of evolve states immediately today even in some of the incidents out there i won't mention it when the law enforcement comes in when they do forensics the first thing they do because often it is a student who has committed and perpetrated those crimes they've done things on that lap there are digital fingerprints everywhere they have searched for weapons they have searched to do and try to get away if you will or understand of how to do certain things um, even you mentioned cyber bullying but cyber security people don't realize uh, not only are they taking away student data and all that, but the reality is they've taken even school safety plans and put it on the dark web. They know exactly where the camera placements are. Um, and so everything is connected or can be connected. And so uh, I think overall you have to have multiple layers in order to really protect and, and start to have the highest level of resiliency against that. And, and part of that also is the vigilance of the individuals going to school.
that's why you're seeing anonymous tip reporting emerge, mm -hmm. like in LAUSD. They just launched that because, you know, there's a whole thing about identifying, then there's prevention, and then there's a response that happens, and then there's a recovery. And that's the way Homeland Security looks at sort of the holistic way of national preparedness for disasters, bad things happening, and I think public safety and school safety should atop that similar type of framework. Mm -hmm. I want to segue now to solutions we can implement in schools today and what you think the singular most important thing would be if you can pick one thing for every school district in this nation to adopt, what would it be and why? You know, like I said, if there was one silver answer uh, that I think it probably would have been done. I don't think there is, but if I would say what there is some fundamental things out there is. Mm -hmm. to get to know uh, those uh, the students through technology, their interactions. Um, often, some of the uh, uh, the challenges uh, there's always called trails of evidence before it happens, and so collecting that and being vigilant before it happens to me is always the best remedy. Uh, and then knowing, and that's not necessarily that could be a technology from a filtering system. It could be data that's being collected with an uh, analytics trending on everything from you know how many student incidents and all that but i also think it also has to do with just um additional just appreciation and, and engaging with students i don't know if you ever saw even one of those uh, uh ted talks called i almost became a school shooter if you haven't seen that i'd watch it it's mm -hmm. very profound it shows an individual who had self-admitted he was like on that day he was getting ready to go do some very bad things in denver but one of the things is another student was just compassionate just but just, hey, let's go do a movie, just talk about nothing. The guy was drug problems, had bad family home bringing, and that interaction positively, uh, I think made a lot of things better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point about just the importance of community and, and the motivations behind yeah. why people commit these acts. Um, yeah. And then also, you know, obviously you are, um, you know, Covex is a technology company, so the role that technology has in fostering that level of connectivity. Yeah. I think also school safety plans need to be well indoctrinated, understood, so if there are things that do happen, before it happens, you know what to do. During when it happens, you know what to do. And then even afterwards, you know what to do. And that plan, I think, saves a lot of headache, uh, and people are much more orderly, and hopefully um, they can prevent it or mitigate it or, or recover effectively with the community. Mm -hmm. So now the, the next place I wanted to go is the future. So we've talked a lot about, you know, things that are on the cusp in the world of AI and all of these really exciting developments and these problematic developments and challenging developments. Is there anything that you are particularly excited about? Yeah, I think uh, it, it goes back to this generative AI because schools are, uh, especially public education, K-12, through are very rich with data. They are sometimes mandated to have archives of almost 20 years of student data. I mean, that's a, sometimes it's a, it's a law. But they don't really take that data and leverage it as an asset. It's like recorded and it's just over there in the shelf and they may do some assessments on who's passing their standard tests and who's not. That's the kind of the basic things, attendance and all that. But I believe the world of data, as I explained before, like social media has really evolved of leveraging data in a very much more profound way to find better insights, predictability, and analytics is gonna to go to the next level. And I think as schools are now going to embrace that data more and more, I'm seeing that happen more, I think you're gonna see more technologies to take, consume the data, uh, make sure it's private, it's uh, uh, you know, an anonymized for the privacy, but yet also able to identify individuals who are not only just having learning challenges, but maybe some social, emotional, or potential risk overall. And that's not just all about big school shootings. I mean, cyberbullying is up, right? Well, physical bullying is gone down, but cyberbullying has doubled and tripled. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's so many other things with data to prevent things and understand and hopefully help. Uh, and then on the back side, I, I think it's really important to make sure that people know how to manage the data and leverage it because there is a certain fear of administrators of touching certain data that are so private and coveted that they feel that uh, bad things will happen to them if they try to do something and they're not, they weren't allowed to do that or they weren't, weren't allowed to see that, they weren't allowed to say that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered in trying to get these initiatives adopted in schools any pushback for 
political reasons, financial reasons, or has it been pretty smooth sailing? It's not smooth sailing. I mean, obviously, there's <laughs> difference of opinions of uh, how to make schools more safer and then the environment more uh, effective. Um, and people also don't realize part of the other biggest school incidents, I mean, gun shootings and violence, the way people interpret that, are, are bad, but it's not the majority. Teachers are getting attacked. <laughs> there's a lot of discipline challenges out there. So um, it, it's not just about the school shootings. I think they get definitely shown on television. The media definitely flocks to that so many other things in there so i would say it's it's hard funding is a challenge um, but i think a proper plan and a resolution in order how to address it and i notice i don't talk about one technology because i think they all come and benefit uh, but at the same time you have to have a well orchestrated way of saying i'm going to create layers and protect myself in layers whether it's in the cyber world or the physical world so that it makes it harder for any bad perpetrator to, to really do bad things or find mechanisms to, to stop it before it happens. And that, I think, is going to evolve. But it's, it's much more broader than just school shootings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, to me, is what is the most exciting. Just when you have something objective like data, you can't, you can't really argue with it when you have those numbers there. And in that regard, it seems to transcend the partisan divides about, right. well, I think this and I think that, if we at least all agree to work with the same set of facts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and sometimes facts can be debated too, if you've noticed <laughs> recently. But um, and, and like I said, and data's not perfect. You want insights. I want that 51% chance that it probably won't happen, but just in case, let me go call Andrew, see he's doing okay, right? And, and sometimes, like I said, it doesn't have to be like, we need to interrogate you. It's like, sometimes, like, hey, how are you doing? You know, is everything okay? And like I said, you go watch one of those individuals who've had disturbing backgrounds and challenging, growing up painful. Um, you know, often they have things that are happening at home that are not in school and they're quiet. But if someone reaches out and understands that, wow, something may be happening, Michael, because of data, um, answer that. And that, I don't think that's partisan because at the end of the day, everybody wants their kids uh, to have a very positive learning environment and not worry about that. But unfortunately, this is a sign of the times right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, while data is objective, the inferences that we make from the data, that's when things can start to be up for debate. And I think that it's a, it's a healthy dialogue and it's an important one. But if we start with the facts, if we start with some objective reasoning, I think that is where, that's where we can find some real meaningful solutions. Absolutely. And I think that's definitely the right path. And then once the data, and everyone agrees that these are the right things, I think how you solve it could be debated, but I think just refuting it and not doing anything is probably the worst answer. Being unable to do things is the worst answer. Mm -hmm. Well, Andrew, this was very, very interesting. I've loved learning about you and Covexa and your partnership with Zero Now. So to conclude, I would love to hear, you know, what is next for the Covexa and Zero Now partnership? What are you guys working on? What are you excited for? Yeah, I, well, I don't know if it's premature, but I'm working with a very large influential organization in K through 12. And I'm, I'm going to bring in Zero Now so they have access to many of these big school leaders across the U.S., so that we can take Zero Now to the next level and really showcase some of the solutions, the offering. You know, unfortunately it has to come with the individuals who had to live through it. But I think sometimes you need to understand and hear the voice of all those victims and the challenges, nonpartisan, to get to the solution. And I think if we can do that at a scaled way, we can cover more ground and have more awareness that hopefully then adopts into more funding, that hopefully adopts into more solutions that protects all of our kids. So when that's announced, I'll make sure it gets published for you guys in the next month or two. How about that? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Andrew. This is a great conversation. I look forward to getting it out there for our board members to hear. Great. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the time.